Hi, and welcome to Revelation Explained, a weekly series where we dive deeper into the book of Revelation. This week, Pastor Gary will be meeting with Pastor Claude Stauffer of Calvary Chapel Hope. Let's join them now. All right. Well, here we are once again, guys. Welcome to our uh, our weekly um, episode of Revelation Explained Plus, where we're plodding, as some of my congregation would tell you, plodding our way through the book of Revelation. We certainly are galloping. I think we're trotting is what we're doing, but glad to be here. And um, we've enjoyed a variety of guests and various people speaking from a variety of backgrounds. But one of my favorites and uh, absolutely one of the guys that that is a go-to, I, I, I used to call him regularly and I felt like with that restraining order that was put out on me that I probably should stop doing that. But once again, we've got uh, Pastor Claude Stauffer here with us, and uh, Pastor uh, Claude is up there in Long Island, and uh, he wrote this wonderful, beautiful series uh, on the book of Revelation, and I, it is a frequent read, and let me tell you, anybody that gets this will not be disappointed, but will be thrilled by it. it I, I've said it all along. It holds the heart of of the theological truth, but it also holds the heart of a pastor. And uh, I would highly recommend it to anybody, whether you're a full-time pastor, part-time pastor, wannabe pastor, lay person, uh, to get his series right here on the practical revelations from the revelation of Jesus Christ. Two volumes. You can get it on Amazon. I would highly recommend it. Claude, how are you doing, my friend? I'm doing very well. Thank you. It's nice to be back. I thank you for inviting me, and it's always a pleasure to uh, talk with you and share with uh, share the practical practical application of the Book of Revelation. You know, it's Amen. always an awesome time. Amen. And um, and you have certainly been, as I stated, and I don't mean that in a high with hyperbole. You have been one of my favorites, and uh, remain that. And uh, listening to you teach over there in lovely Israel, any. Um, uh, you know, as we look down the line, you know, I, I have a sneaky suspicion the next time we're in Israel will be um, in the new, we're well, not in the new heaven, new earth, but we'll be uh, when Jesus Christ comes back and we come back with him could very well be then that we get. Well, I'll, I'll settle for that. I mean, listen, look, you know, none of us can give a tour like Jesus could give a tour. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm happy. I'm happy to have King Jesus giving us a tour around heaven. That's all I can tell you. But um, we're here to talk this week. And as you've been, uh, as you know, the sort of the format of what we do, it's kind of loosey goosey. And uh, just looking, you know, I I talk to various people about their views and their ideas. And um, we're in chapter 19. We we have made some progress, believe it or not. We are in chapter 19 of the book of Revelation. And um, a fascinating, fascinating book. And just to kind of set it up a little bit for those people that are tuned in and watching this on our YouTube channel. Um, 17 and 18, of course, 17, we see the fall of religious Babylon, you know, the ecumenical coexist uh, mentality of, of what we're already seeing laid out in the church now. Um, I, I think that we're, we're way down the line towards that mentality. And then, of course, in chapter 18, we're, we're in the economic political worldwide one government system. And we watch the judgment brought on both of those systems. And, um, and then we come to chapter 19 and that's what we're going to discuss uh, tonight or today, I should say, is just that. And that is, um, that is post uh, judgment on Babylon. So let me just start off asking this question there, Pastor Claude, when you look at the, when you consider Babylon, do you look at Babylon as a um, as more of a? I heard one person say, "Listen, the best way to describe Babylon is just saying the world's systems, the way the world does things." Do you believe in physical Babylon also, or do you believe in just kind of the spiritual Babylon? Well, I don't. You know, uh, sometimes it's not. Uh, sometimes it's not an either or. You okay. know, I think I very. I think very. I think the. Um, there might be the rise of the literal uh, city of Babylon in the end times. You know, um, uh, Saddam Hussein, uh, you know, before he was executed, yeah. before all the stuff came down, you know, and then this is about 20 years ago, you can imagine. Um, 
you know, he, he was in the process of, of rebuilding Babylon and, um, you know, it's still a, it's, you know, it's an archeological site. I don't know that it'll ever reach what it once was, but I, I do lean though to as being more of a world right. system that, that is, that is the outgrowth of the tower of Babel where really where you have the proliferation of um, world religions, you have the um, divisions of the people, the, the, um, the uh, you know, division of language. And uh, really, when you begin to look at the Tower of Babel, right. you really, it's really a, um, you know, when you, when you, when you, you know, when we talk about sin, right? When, when we talk about the origins of sin, we think immediately to Genesis chapter three, uh-huh. right? But really, uh, when you look like, uh, I've, I, if you're familiar with Michael Heiser, hmm. who's an ex- excellent uh, Bible teacher, really. I think you mentioned him before, absolutely. Yeah, if, he, if you want to read a really good book, The Unseen Realm by Michael Heiser, he's really a scholar, but he's, talks in a way that you can understand and uh which is really a gift let me tell you well i'm i'm, um, I'm a dr seuss guy myself so yeah <laughs> if you can rhyme it and <laughs> but anyway yeah i don't i'm not going to re rhyme in today bro right, um, there you go. <laughs> but he he what he says he says if you were to talk to a jew and, and the origins really of sin really the three events is in the early history uh of of scripture you know the the fall in the in the Garden of Eden, but then also you had the flood in chapter mm-hmm. six, and then the Tower of Babel in chapter three, and really chap or in chapter three, chapter eleven right. of Genesis, and really in 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 chapter eleven of Genesis, you have kind of like it's kind of like um, bureaucracy begins or the the system the systemic uh, proliferation of sin in the world you know it begins you know with false religious systems false governmental systems and all of these things and it just goes from there everything else is traced back back to there where where you have this kind of um societal rebellion against the lord in at the tower of babel right you know? so um Good. Another good book is uh, Alexander Hislop's The Two Babylons. I know some people look at that book as being a little bit antiquated, but sometimes the best books are the antiquated books, the old books. A lot of the new stuff is kind of cotton candy-ish. I'll and, present um, to you Genesis and Exodus and Levit- Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. <laughs> they're all older books, but they're very yeah, yeah. and relevant, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 I, um, I, I'm fascinated by... Um, you know, and as we were going through it, I'm fascinated by Babylon just because of what you're saying. And that is, you know, the groundwork that was laid there. I, you know, I spoke to my congregation about it and I said, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? That, that you know, God had created and did the things he did and immediately Satan kind of created the counterpart. And the concept of that, of course, is by the time you get to Jerusalem and, and you know, we see Jerusalem mentioned throughout the Bible. Well, um, Satan has his city, and the city, of course, is Babylon, the, the mentality of Babylon. Yeah. And I concur with you. I, I think it could be a physical place, but I don't, I don't know if that's the importance of it as much as it's just the idea of it and what it stands for and um, looking at both you know, the economic or the one world government, the one world religious system, and all these things that it that because in the judgment of it, you know, through 17 and 18, yeah. you, you really see it being exposed for what it did, that it led people astray and that that the world loved these places, you know, love not the world. Well, loving the world seems to me that it's almost falling in love with Babylon, you know. Yeah. Um, so but anyway, good references on the books, too, for people to uh, pick up and uh, go ahead and mention the two books that you mentioned just then. Um, the Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. Okay, that's the older book. And then uh, really, um, The Unseen Realm by Michael Heiser. Now, that was really his first book where he really began to be popular. He's written a number of books, I think one on angels, one on demons. Uh, but he's written a number of books. And 
they're they're there's it's perfect he, he writes in a way that's a really a perfect balance of scholarship and understandability you gotcha. know so so and he's really um i like him because he's very inductive in the way he approaches oh. scripture right he does not he does not um he does not find determine his beliefs and then go to scripture to try to superimpose them on scripture he goes to scripture he lets scripture speak and so he really um you know he really uh clarifies you know what is based on scripture and what is not yeah well but it's really really important well not to not just to blow smoke or anything but it it's that reminds me a little bit of your of the commentaries on the book of revelation that you wrote they're they're just wonderfully written but anyway um chapter 19 then by the time we get to 19 claude if you could sum up chapter 19 of the book of revelation in a sentence or a short paragraph how would you sum up this chapter then well i would just say uh i would just say it's 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 the final uh well The Lord is is bringing this to bear on all the rebellion uh, that has been going on. That's been let loose on the earth for the seven year period. He this is the climax. Now, what's interesting is that in chapter 19, you have that climactic event of the return of Jesus. Right. You have the introductory words and then you have reference to the marriage supper of the lamb and this and this, um, you know, Jesus. coming vanquishing his foes it's kind of like it's an interesting climax to this book because from chapter 19 you have the climax in chapter 19 which is the second coming of christ chapter then into chapter 20s you have the establishment of god's kingdom on earth the thousand year reign of christ on earth you have the great then you you move into the great white throne judgment and then uh which is the final judgment and then you have the the, uh, the 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 introduction of the new heaven and the yeah. new earth right. in chapter 21 and t- so it just it's kind of like this incredible chapter 19 20 21 and 22 four chapter climax to God's prophetic plans you know and it's just uh I mean it really is so you can't really point to one of these chapters and say it's yeah. climactic because it just it's like you know it's like with the Lord you know like in Ephesians chapter 3 he says Paul writes, he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think. It's like, bang. Jesus returns. Right. Bang. He is still, yeah. It's just like, so it's, it's awesome. And then God's, and then the climax, everything, God's abode, the new Jerusalem is brought down to earth. So God, we will be with him and he will be with us. How spectacular is that going to be, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean you know, so, so I, mean, I, get, I get chills just wow. thinking about it, you know. Well, what's interesting is I told our people the same thing. Now, we just got to the first half of this chapter, um, but hopefully we'll, you and I will get through all of it. But then what's interesting to me is, you know, you go through the heaviness of chapter basically six through up till 19. And then, of course, in the beginning of 19 with the with the battle. Um, you know, and it's very heavy on mankind and it's almost like such a downer in some ways. And you, you can understand why people would go, oh, this is so difficult and it's so hard, all these people. And, but, but it's really setting up ultimately, like you're saying now it's time Christ basically is cleaning house 17, 18, and even in 19, uh, the, you know, the armies that train their guns or turn their guns. Christ is really cleaning house is what he's doing. He's saying, you know, basically it was enough. The contrast 17, 18 to 19, there's such a contrast that once you look at 19, you're, you're just blown away. And that's why even in the first few chapters, you know, after these things, I heard a loud voice, a great multitude in heaven, and they were saying, Alleluia, salvation, glory, honor, power belong to the Lord, our God, true and righteous are his judgments. He has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth. Of course, that's Babylon. Uh, and he has avenged on her the blood of the servants that she has shed. You know, now all of a sudden it's like this. You're watching this movie and the you're, you're watching the good guys just get take it on the chin. And 
They seem to be getting beaten and everyone's killing off these tribulation saints. And then bang, that's it. You're done. And Babylon goes into judgment. And then we see this beautiful, wonderful contrast because on earth they're weeping, right? They're watching Babylon destroyed, but in heaven, they're rejoicing greatly. Mm -hmm. It's powerful. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's an incredible portion of scripture. And interestingly, the word Alleluia occurs four times in the New Testament, and all four times are in this chapter. Right. Yeah. Okay. No, and it's and it's and it's an expression. It's a it's a um, it's a uh, like a, a stepsister to the word Hallelujah, which we're more familiar with. But Alleluia means you know praise Yah, praise the Lord. You know, right. and it's just uh, an incredible incredible um portion of scripture here and you know you have to understand really and you know we see when we look at today you know we just had an election yesterday right so and i from what i'm from initial reports are that it seems as though there's been uh, some changes on the for the good which is a good thing but you know no matter what no matter what governmental system that we have Right. Right. Whether it's, you know, a federal republic, democracy, socialism, you know, capitalism, socialism, communism, totalitarianism, empire, you know, whatever it is, it's all going to fall short. Yeah, that's right. Until Jesus is crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's until a government like we like, you know, pretty soon it'll be Christmas. We'll read Isaiah 9, 6. The government will be upon his shoulders, right? So what you have is you have the fulfillment of that here. So that's why there's such an exclamation of worship and praise to God. You know, I mean, it just these words are like, man, just so encouraging, you know, and for the Christian, this is part of what gives us hope is we know what the final chapters are. You yeah. know, and that's yeah. that's so important, especially when things seem to be, um, you Can know, go, going to hell in a handbasket, yeah. as, as some might say. You know, and that would be a book to write right there, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. But you're right, and I think I think what we're seeing is is the fruition, the 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 the, the coming of this. And you know, I'm, I'm a dispensationalist, unabashedly a dispensationalist, and I think the dispensations teach us that mankind just cannot rule themselves. So we're just incapable, no matter what it is, what the system, like you're saying, you know, whatever ism you follow, uh, the truth is it's all, it all ends up as humanism until there's a theocracy, until God is ruling and reigning and, and, you know, starting with the throne in Jerusalem. But anyway, uh, so we see, cause in verse two, it reminds us true and righteous are his judgments. Right. And so, right. you know, we, we have never, <laughs> In this world, I don't care if you're an Abraham Lincoln guy, a Ronald Reagan guy, you know, whoever it is, you laud as as the great, great politician, statesman. Well, listen, that no one's ever been true and righteous in all their judgments and, you know, and, and been able to do the things that we're going to see coming. And so obviously, again, you know, always fair, always righteous. And this is what 19 unveils right up front. Bang, guys. Finally, finally, you're seeing the truth of all these things, uh, which which to me is is mind blowing. And of course, you know, by the time we get to the end of all these things, you're going to see once again in the millennial reign. Anyway, mankind just can't deal with it because unregenerated man is still going to rebel against it. Yeah. Now, there's another aspect on top of this that where God brings victory Um for instance, when you look at Daniel chapter 2, verse 43, and Daniel is being given the interpretation of the of the, the feet of that giant image, yeah. that 90 foot tall image, the iron mixed with clay. Yes. There's an interesting phrase uh, there, an interesting comment uh, in verse 43 of Daniel chapter 2, which talks about the seed being mingled with men. Right. right? Yeah. And... Um, you know, Jesus said that in the latter times, right, the last days, that would be as in the days of Noah. 
right? So when you go back to the flood, which is the days of Noah, you go back to Genesis chapter six, one of the things you begin to uncover when you do a little bit of uh, scriptural spade work and investigation is, right. is that um, you saw the sons of God, which are these spiritual beings. They lusted after the daughters of men and they took them for right. lives and they and they tried to basically tried to make their own kingdoms. And in the process, like, for instance, if you look at some extra biblical sources, what they say is that these beings, all right, these beings actually uh, introduced all kinds of occult practices, yeah, magic, right. all kinds of all kinds of um, carnal types of things. And if and G, so what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is. Jesus said that these latter days would be as the days of Noah. So we're going to see a spiritual element, right, in all of this too. So it's not merely the Antichrist. It's the Antichrist that's powered by the devil, right? It's, yes. a, it's a false prophet who is also powered by the devil. And you see in, in chapter 9, for instance, you see the pit opened up and these locusts, these demonic beings come out and you see you see the frogs Right in chapter sixteen, the frogs, um, right. which are which are symbol symbolic of demonic influences too. So, so all of these these hordes of nations and kings and antichrist and false prophet, all of these rebels, all of these who are defying the Lord, all that are trying to destroy His people. Right, they're vanquished in chapter nineteen. So it's on just on a on a horizontal plane, but also be beyond that. It's, it's all this darkness, all of this demonic right. is just vanquished by the Lord, squashed, you know, stomped. You know, in Romans sixteen verse twenty, uh, Paul was inspired to write, "And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly." <laughs> you know, Paul, you know, and that that's really speaking about Revelation chapter nineteen. Wow. That's where that's where it's happening, you know. You think about you think about uh, it, it really reminds you when you go in I think this text in 19 is perfect to remind you of the tale of two cities. And I think that the kingdom of Babylon and and the idea of pristine Jerusalem, the idea of what Jerusalem will be. Mm -hmm. And I think you see the contrast between what what will be the kingdom of our God and what is the kingdom of this world, and the philosophies, and you find out who's behind it because you brought up so appropriately, like, for instance, all the demonic activity that's in this world that right now we still are only getting glimpses of once the Holy Spirit's pulled out of here and all this spiritualism will be revealed. And I believe all starting and, and being perpetrated out of sort of this Babylonian mentality uh, you're really going to see that stuff coming to a forefront. People will be terrified. People will be uh, terrified to the part where they want to die. Uh, but then one in one fell swoop, man, God's going to destroy it is what he's going to do, which is pretty interesting. We see uh, in verse three there that there's another hallelujah that's going to rise up because the people are going to see that the smoke of Babylon will rise up forever and ever. And I take that as more than anything else that that the the destruction of Babylon will be total and will be eternal. Uh, never Babylon will never the philosophy, the mentality, the uh, the auspices of what Babylon is will never be seen again, destroyed. And it's yeah, sort of what I mean, we're it's, talking about. It's going to be, you know, um, if you look at the end of Revelation chapter twenty, at the beginning of Revelation twenty, it says that the devil is chained right and restrained yeah. he cannot influence the earth for a thousand years right but at the end of that thousand years it says that he is one last time let loose why because there will be people that are birthed in those pristine sure. environment of the of the kingdom who you know they need to they need to be they need to be experience their probation or their um their temptation to test their faith, to see who their allegiances truly are for, you know, with the Lord or not. And some un un incredibly, when you think about this, incredibly right. will, will 
are, will be susceptible to the temptation. And one last time at the end of Revelation chapter 20, um, one, that one last uprising will be squashed. And then devil, antichrist, false prophet, and all who have rebelled against the Lord, they will be cast into that, to that lake of fire. And, you know, that's another thing, bro. Um, you know, in, in much of the woke church or in much of the progressive church um, or much of the se- used to be called seeker friendly church, um, you really didn't hear a whole lot about hell. You wouldn't really speak about it because yeah, it, was, right. it made people feel too uncomfortable. Sure. And, um, you know, I'm not a, I'm not, you know, I don't preach turn or burn, you know, I, but, you know, the scripture, Jesus spoke more about hell than he did about heaven. Yeah, right. And so, you know, it's part of the gospel. Really, if you if you cut the if you cut hell out of the gospel, then why why is there a need to be saved? Yeah, well, there is why no need. Good news. Everything's right. Good news. You know, so there's there's a reason, but you know, and, and some people will look at hell and they say, Well, how could a just God punish people eternally for anything? Right. And right. you see, our we're we're so limited, we're so low, we're so base. We're so common and not, we're so unholy, right? We're unholy in our understanding of God's justice and his holiness and his standard. You know, we all fall short of the glory of God, you know, that, um, and we're so, like you said it before, you know, we're you, you, humanistic, right? We're huh. so man or, or woman or human centered and not God oriented that we, we don't, our standards are far different. You know, we, we're so used to being flawed and failing and sinful that instead of dealing with our sin, we kind of excuse it or rationalize it away. But isn't that part uh, of what we're in? I mean, listen, I have a fire pit in my backyard and the other night, that nice cool evening, I went, I went out and built a, uh, you know, I got and listened to, podcasts and stuff and i'm sitting around this fire and i uh, built the fire you know lit it and everything let sit out there for an hour and a half two hours whatever i go in the house and i smell like smoke why because i'm i'm there i'm at my fire ring i'm i'm, I'm close to that fire and i think sometimes as believers we we smell like this world unfortunately we don't want to but we realize it like you know, I'm still, no matter what I try to do, I get tainted by the things of this world. I, I, I absorb, unfortunately, the odor of this world. I don't want it. I don't want to. But it's so subtle and yeah. deceptive that it just seeps in at times. You know, you start to think of things and churches do the same thing. They'll slide. Yeah. This is why Paul warns us, you know, be careful of these things. You know, false teachers are going to come in, wolves that are going to just eat the sheep you know they're tainted by this stuff yeah so, yeah you know yeah. i'll tell you a story you know back in march i i uh had covid i had a pretty bad case of it uh i was very very sick uh, a few months after that after my recovery i i started to notice something that i couldn't smell and i really can't st- i have i'm still not able to really smell things really and it's kind of it's kind of weird yeah it's like an after effect and um you know, so what happened, what I can remember going to get gas for my car and, um, you know, some you can smell, usually you can smell a gas. Gas is a very, you know, yeah. strong aroma, but yeah. I couldn't smell it. So I went one time and I, and when I took the, the hose out of the car, evidently I spilled some gas on, on myself and, you and didn't, even realize not, it. didn't even realize, but when I came into the house, <laughs> you know, my wife was saying, "What you stink? What did you do?" You know, and 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 I said, "I'm sorry, honey." You That's know, when you wish you lost your hearing. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's like that. It's the world, right? It's the world. Sometimes, yeah. as we live our lives, you know, we we kind of you know we pick up these these unholy aromas. It's like getting you know you walk on, you get tar on your shoes and you drag that in. You know, this dirt, this filth, and it's only. You know, that's where that's where the blood of Jesus comes in, you know, cleanse us, you know, the Amen. have a fragrant aroma. Yeah. You know, cleanse, cleanse us from all of that. Point it out to me, Holy stuff. Spirit. What is what is it that I'm that I'm eating porridge for for my birthright? What am I 
what am I, what am I engaging in that, you know, it's somewhere along the line, the Holy Spirit is so loving and gracious that, you know, the Holy Spirit points these things out. But I, I guess the only thing I'm pointing out there is, you know, I think sometimes we can be seduced into things that we, we have to constantly be before the Lord. I love this chapter because it points out that in heaven, they have great clarity. So they see all this with yeah. great clarity. They understand what this is about. They're saying to us, hey, you know, we're rejoicing because we understand how deceptive this system has been. We understand how destructive the world has been. If you'd like to hear more on this topic, our previous services are always found on our YouTube channel. Please consider subscribing so you can stay up to date on all of our content. The church would like to once again thank Pastor Claude Stoffer for joining us this week. Be sure to join us on Sunday, either in person or on YouTube with our live stream service at 930.